Well, it should be in Australian, hist Australian history, but it's not. See, the Battle of Surigao Strait, hardly anyone's ever heard of it. There was uh, 16 Japanese ships and 50 American and two Australian ships. <clears throat> One of our major battles, which was the, uh, well, the last great sea battle of all time, was uh, the Battle of Surigao Straits, where the US 7th um, Fleet and... Uh, and third fleet uh, and uh, Australian ships. There was only only two Australian ships uh, involved in that: the Shropshire and the Arunta, which was a destroyer. And uh, we were involved in these the actual sea battle of what they call uh, the sea battles of Leyte. Uh, but uh, it was divided into four different battles that went on over four or five days or a week, and it involved. Um, Battleships and cruisers and destroyers and motor torpedo boats and aircraft carriers and uh, submarines and goodness knows what. And our uh, we were in what they call the Battle of Surigao Straits. That was one of the four battles, and uh, which was fought at night time in the early hours of uh, I think it was the twenty fifth of October, nineteen forty four. Here are Australian warships, American and Dutch. In the coming days and nights, General MacArthur's vast armada will forge on. In April, May 43, the cruiser Shropshire, which had been uh, given to Australia by the by UK to replace the Canberra, which had been sunk at Savo Island uh, <clears throat> in August '42. Uh, we commissioned in uh, in Chatham Dockyard, and uh, I stayed in that ship. We of course came out to Australia, and we worked in the Southwest Pacific with the US Seventh Fleet all the way through to the Philippines and um, Borneo and so on, and eventually ended up in Tokyo Bay for the signing of the surrender. And um, so I'd stayed in Shropshire right through that last two years of the war, quite active um, time. Of course, Lady Gulf consisted of not only the landing, but the Battle of Surigao Strait, in which we were the only Australian cruiser there because the Australia had go back for repairs. Uh, one of the Australian destroyers, Warramunga, took her back to Manus. And so a runter and ourselves, the only Australian ship in this very large American force of, I forget now, about four four or five battleships and about 10 cruisers and about 50 destroyers or something, 40 destroyers. Um, and so we participated in that. The guns worked and our shells appeared to go in the right direction. Remember that uh, we were a very, very small number compared with all the ships that they had. Uh, most of the time, uh, uh, well, our cruisers, for instance, Australia had seven cruisers, I think, at the start of the war. Three of them were 18-inch cruisers. One was sunk, the Canberra. The Australia was later put out of action for a time through kamikaze attacks. Uh, the Perth had been sunk. Uh, some of our destroyers had been sunk. They were getting uh, pretty old, some of them. We had a couple of new uh, brilliant destroyers called the Arunta and Warramunga, tribal class destroyers, that were, were fairly new. So when you add them all up, it, it's a very, very small number compared with the huge number of ships that the Americans had. We used to be just amazed to see the equipment and the ships and the aircraft and everything else that the, the Americans had. 
it seemed fairly obvious, you know, in those days that the Americans, with all their uh, equipment, would, would eventually beat the Japanese. But, of course, there were a few rude shocks along the way uh, yet. A good ship with, uh, with plenty of radar on it. I'd heard that before, when I was at the radar school. They reckon Shropshire was the most up-to-date one in the Pacific at that time. And uh, if, if I got to Shropshire, they reckon um, it, it's a pretty good ship to, to be on. Uh, part of the uh, American 7th Fleet we were, Task Force 74, which was the, the Nashville, the Phoenix, the Chicago, and uh, a lot of the other, sh other ships in part of this part of this fleet. But, um, as far as, what's the name? As I said, the Yang School is hopeless and helpless um, until we went into action because, because they look so cumbersome. Big, big, long ships, and you know, that old-fashioned. Uh, they, they thought their modern ships, you know, it's a lot better than ours. But uh, once we got into action, they found it slightly different. Well, J, well, J Bird was our call sign on the on the radio, and um, we we got a lot of praise from uh, from the uh, things for the, all the. Um, radar reports on, on sighted aircraft. Yeah, we'd have the big, uh, we'd have the big ensign, like the naval ensign, and also the Australian flag. It's one of the biggest Australian flags I've, I've seen. It's a huge flag, that, and they put it up, the battle ensign, the Australian, the Australian blue flag. It was good because all the Yanks around us, there's, there's these four Australian ships in amongst them. Because General MacArthur, if it was an American uh, action, he'd say that the Americans done it. They wouldn't say Australians, he'd say it was the Allies that, the same at New Guinea. Uh, when the uh, Japanese got turned around, it, it wasn't the Americans, it was the Allies. He wouldn't say the Australians beat the Japanese. these ships. United States battleship, Maryland class. United States battleship, Oklahoma class. Shropshire had a complete in, uh, refit. It was built in about 1928, but it had a complete refit in early and late 1942, early 43, and they had the most modern equipment that they could provide. And apart from having the radar, so we could always tell where where the planes were coming in, we reported something like 90% of the air raids we reported in the area. But they also made our 8-inch guns so they could elevate to about 75 degrees, 70 or 75 degrees. And we used to um, load them with uh, high-explosive shells that were calibrated to explode at 5,000, 10,000 feet. And so we were using our 8-inch guns, which were a surface gun, we were using them actually as anti-aircraft guns. And they were actually blowing planes, either they're blowing them up or blowing them off course. And I was actually on deck one time when they, the alarm sounded and uh, there were a couple of these planes uh, coming on and towards us and they swung the 18-inch the guns around to fire a barrage. When we commissioned in uh, Chatham in April 1943, uh, we had been fitted with uh, more radar sets than Australia. And we had uh, also control units uh, so that we could separately control each of our 8-inch turrets. And they were set to uh, fire a barrage against aircraft, aircraft attack. And a barrage means that you fire a shell at a certain distance 
uh, obviously ahead of the aircraft coming in, uh, we could fire it at a barrage range of 6,000 yards or 3,000 yards. And um, that gave us quite a bit of flexibility. And uh, we felt later on that that contributed a great degree to uh, the deterrent effect we had on Japanese aircraft attacking us much later in 1944 and 45. Um, we had the same basic anti-aircraft armament with the twin four-inch, four twin four-inch mountings as Australia. Uh, we initially had um, Ehrlichan guns and then we both had to change to Bofors, a uh, 40 millimeter Bofors gun. But that wasn't done until um, 1944 when we were into um, operations in the Southwest Pacific. Well, the, the, the Ehrlichan gun being 20 mil uh, was really um, was rather like uh, throwing peas in the sky against uh, determined aircraft attacks. The range wasn't sufficient and the hitting power wasn't sufficient. So we managed to get a number, I think about a dozen, single barrel Bofors, 40 millimeter Bofors guns, and that, that enhanced our ability quite a lot. A fine radar ship, uh, what's the name? Well, the Yanks didn't appreciate it until uh, later in the war, how, how good she was, but in, in the end, it, um, the, uh, in the Lady campaign, the Shropshire not, uh, reported 90% of first sightings of enemy aircraft because of the range of, we had in the radar. We'd throw that up at them. You know, who did all the reports of the aircraft coming in? <laughs> Shropshire, Jaybird. But um, I was proud to be a radar operator on the, on the Shropshire because it, it kept, kept you busy. And if you're busy, you, don't, you haven't got time to think about, about what else is going on other than what you're doing. And I think that was a lot of the reason why you don't, um, what's the name? You don't um, crack up. Uh, first of all, I was down in the uh, weather con control, in the uh, fire control downstairs. Um, I was on that, that's, that's where I learned about uh, the overs and unders for, for the shelling. Uh, I was on that for a while. And then, um, they, then they shifted me up onto the fighter control where, where, the, where you, you um, had the enemy aircraft. And that was my main, main, main job. And once I was into, into that one, I stayed there for the rest of the, until I got my discharge. Actually, I, I was given the job of maintaining the 8-inch uh, table, as we call it, it was a computer, which um, um, controlled the, uh, uh, the main arm, 8-inch guns. And my uh, uh, boss, uh, the PO, uh, knew what I'd done in uh, the torpedo school and uh, he didn't want to have any part of the 18th TS. And he said, that's your job. Uh, don't fall in. Uh, don't, nothing else touches you. You just, you know, make sure that damn thing goes, sort of thing. And I did, and I, I did it most conscientiously. I, I even had my hammock down there and laid out as a, a bed and saved getting up and down the, the uh, st uh, stairs and hatch. Uh, it was on the bottom of the ship. I was there for eight months, uh, or, and um, the only unfortunate thing was that uh, when you closed up, you were you could hear everything, but you yeah, couldn't see what was going on. One day they called for volunteers to do a radar course. So anyone that was good at maths, they wanted to volunteer for radar. And they, uh, we went down and we had an examination. The examination was the uh, officer put a clock in front of a mirror and you had to tell him what the time was for, uh, in the reflection on the mirror. <laughs> that was the only exam. <laughs> How does that qualify you to be a radar operator? <laughs> oh, so, uh, because um, 
when I was a radar plotter, you had to write upside down so the person on the other other side of the table could read what what I wrote. So uh, if I could read what was back the front, uh, you could write back the front. It, it took a bit to learn how to write back the front. The S's and the N's were the were the funny things. You try and write back back the front S's and N's. Once I finished the radar course, they posted me uh, direct to the uh, shops here. Thirteen different radar sets, all doing different jobs. So the, all the controlling the guns, all the main one I was on was with the plotting uh, was a 282, they called the radar, uh, with a range of about 175 miles. We could pick up Japanese planes about 175 miles away. And um, we'd be, I'd uh, have, have the, the board on the board uh, plotting the uh, direction of the planes and I had to tell the officer by writing on the board what speed they were doing, what direction they were in, and also how high they were. The radar operator on the radar set would tell me what height they were, and I'd have to work out the, the speed and direction they were, they were in. And then uh, when the uh, American aircraft went out, uh, we, we had to um, plot for interception. And uh, it was a very interesting job, and, uh, but very... Uh, uh, time demanding because uh, when we was in a actual action, uh, we had half an hour on duty and half an hour off because uh, in the fighter direction we had two crews, uh, half hour on, half hour off, because uh, it was very you, you were going flat out all the time, so half an hour at a time was a was a good time. U.S. forces in the Western Pacific had progressed by September 44 to Moratai and Palau. One month later, a strong invasion armada moved toward the island of Leyte in the vulnerable central Philippines. And of course, after Moratoy, we uh, formed that huge armada of ships, which was about 700, and proceeded to the, uh, to the Philippines to uh, make the initial landings at, uh, in Late Gulf. From, from Moratai, uh, we knew that something big was building up because there were oil tankers, there were battleships, there were cruisers, there were destroyers, there were survey ships, there were patrol torpedo boats, there were all sorts of ships assembling in, in this great harbour. And we eventually found out that we were to invade the Philippines. Now, I think our armada uh, contained about 700 ships of all descriptions. Now, we were uh, part of the American 7th Fleet. The American 7th Fleet was split into... Uh, or say three or four groups, they'd refer to you as uh, Task Force uh, 7 point something or whatever it was, or Group 77.1, and, and uh, we were uh, part of that. Now, we arrived in the Philippines uh, in October of 1944, and I think it was the... Uh, the 21st of October when the Americans actually landed their troops in the Philippines. Convoy going north over the limitless expanse of deep blue ocean, each turn of thousands of propellers taking this huge striking force closer to its goal. There can be no hesitation now, no turning back. The course lies northwards. So another day and another going north. Five days out, D-Day. There is the objective seen dimly in the grey dawn light. Commodore John Collins, commander of the Australian Naval Squadron, in his place on the bridge of the Australia. It's action stations now. There are nips about. There were ships all the way to the horizon in front of us and ships all the way to the horizon behind us. And they said it was bigger than uh, Normandy, the, the landing was going to be. So um, that was that, that was en enough to for us to realise it was... We've heard what, norm, what uh, B-Day at Normandy was. 
when you heard what that was like and seen uh, films of it in the newsreel when we was home and leave. And uh, we knew that this was one time we would see really action. We had a American uh, admiral that's in charge of the fleet and was all allotted a certain certain position. And we had to keep, um, like the ships was there, we might be 500, 700 yards apart sort of thing. And, and you had to keep keep your station. And that was part of our radar. You had to make sure that you was the right distance away from that ship and the other ship. And uh, it was the, the first first plane, enemy plane we ever seen was about two days out. There's a lone Japanese plane spotted the fleet and uh, the Americans, they wasted that much ammunition on, <laughs> on that one plane. It wasn't funny. You'd think there was a fl uh, real squadron of planes because was, nearly every ship was firing at, at this one plane. It was just like a, cur a curtain of, uh, of fire. And um, uh, Yanks did, used too much ammunition, I reckon. They just fired willy-nilly just to fire the guns, I reckon. They weren't too accurate at times. And other times uh, there was that many... Um, Shells going off at the one time, they, they blow them to bits. But um, it was interesting to watch that type, type of thing. Uh, on our way up, we hooked up a mine, which was um, very awkward because it was uh, around uh, three o'clock in the morning. And we couldn't do much about it uh, in the dark. And bearing in mind that we had a, a line of 40 miles of ships behind us, uh, we had to be careful about uh, uh, letting it go without uh, uh, endangering the other ships. So we, our captain was a marvellous fellow. They, they woke him up and they'd told him the precautions that had been taken and he, he looked over the side in his pyjamas and he said, oh, what a beauty, you know. And he said, right, I'm going to thank you. So wake me up a little bit earlier before um, uh, action stations in the morning and uh, we'll, you know, we'll see what we can do about it. And he went back to bed. So he was a marvellous fellow. He, uh, you know, he had his confidence in the crew. Um, so we had to get rid of the darn thing, and fortunately, as we we're pulling the uh, pulling it in, it uh, shot uh, shook free, and we had a chappy on the quarter deck throw a smoke float uh, over the uh, the mine, and then we signalled the other ships and told them that uh, you know there was a mine there and marked with a smoke float and what have you. So that was that. There was another one free, floating free. He just went down the ship's side without touching. Hmm. That was on the way to uh, uh, Leyte. Uh, there was some other Australian ships up there, the minesweepers and the West Australia and uh, the Menorah. They was already up there, up there as part of this fleet. There was more than the four Australian ships in the convoy. And um, the mine, actually, the Australian minesweepers went in uh, and swept some of the channels into into uh, the Leyte before the two days before the actual the big ships came. And they got uh, the Japs should have been prepared because with their aircraft there, if they, someone was minesweeping their their waterway, but they didn't they didn't uh, catch on. American men of war, alerted to the Japanese approach, raced to put a stopper in the bottleneck of Surigao Strait. Admiral Kincaid stuffs the bottleneck with PT boats, destroyers, cruisers and battleships. American and Australian ships and sailors comprise a floating dam across the strait. Strong in firepower, strong in determination to hold. The Admiral orders positions taken. He 
it was a battle which commenced about three o'clock in the morning of the uh, of the 25th of October on a uh, rather still night, dark night, and it was a uh, uh, it's hard to describe this site. My action station on that particular night was uh, in the remote control office, which is located um, uh, just below the bridge. And uh, when you opened the door, you were on the upper deck. So that flimsy sort of door that was there was not going to sh uh, save you from any shell that might come your way. It would have gone straight through it anyway and through the remote control office. So we were able to open that door and view what was going on. And it was like daylight out there with all ships firing and ships being struck by shells, ships being struck by torpedoes. As far as the number of ships the number of ships sunk, the number of men involved, the number of men killed. Uh, the Surigao Strait was the, uh, the largest fleet-to-fleet -fleet action that's uh, ever taken place. And the two Australian ships that were in that were the uh, HMAS Shropshire, an 8-inch heavy cruiser, and the HMAS Aronto, a destroyer. Many times the shells dropped close by, and I recall seeing shells drop close by in the Battle of the Surigao Strait because it was so bright out there, outside, you, you, you could see what was going on. You could see the, uh, the flashes from the guns, the torpedoes uh, hitting ships and, uh, and, and all that. So well, we all assembled in the southern port of, portion of Lady Gulf. Uh, during the night, um, and the the access into the Gulf was from Surigao Strait, which was right at the southern end. So, the ships who came into the Gulf had to come in virtually in line ahead, one after the other, one leading the other. And that's where the Japanese came in. But as we had the freedom of the Gulf, we spread the, the admiral spread the forces across the Gulf. That's the famous old thing, of course, crossing the T. It goes back to Nelson and so on. But crossing the T. So the concentrated fire of this line of ships can go in on this single line of ships approaching them. So we crossed the T in, in, uh, in, Ling in Surigao Strait. The U.S. 3rd Fleet lay in wait for a possible attack by enemy naval units in the Philippine Sea, to the east of the central Philippines. The U.S. 7th Fleet protected the entrance to Leyte Gulf and the beachhead. On October 23rd and 24th, two Japanese naval forces proceeded eastward toward the U.S. position on Leyte. At 9.10 a.m. on the 24th, Halsey's carriers launched their planes in an attack on the enemy's central force. At 10.20, the enemy fleet was spotted entering the Sibuyan Sea. At 3.30, the Japanese force turned and withdrew after hits had been scored on several of its warships. Survivors of the super battleship Musashi sunk by U.S. air action were picked up by other enemy ships. The enemy's naval strategy called for a decoy force to try to lure Halsey out of position. Halsey bit. He took his third fleet north to meet the expected threat, since he thought that the enemy's central force had been routed. But that force had reversed itself again. Seventh Fleet escort carriers were all that stood between the Leyte beachhead and the Japanese central force, which slipped through San Bernardino Strait at midnight. Meanwhile, the main strength of the 7th Fleet was concentrated on Surigao Strait as the enemy's southern force approached it from the other side. In Leyte, we uh, had the problem of uh, knowing that the uh, Japanese fleet was out and we had the information that they were attacking in uh, 
uh, three sections, uh, two fleets from the south and one from the north that we knew of. Uh, and we were uh, in uh, the Lady Gulf in uh, uh, Admiral Oldendorf's um, task force and we had six uh, American battleships uh, that had survived Pearl Harbour or they'd been rebuilt after Pearl Harbour and um, we had um, two flanks of cruisers. There were four uh, on our side, the, the right flank, and five on the, the left flank. And we were lined up uh, across the uh, the Gulf, which was 13 miles uh, wide at that point. And we knew that the Jap fleet was coming from the south through uh, Surigao Strait. And... Uh, we had the knowledge that there were two fleets. Um, we uh, were all set for um, a night action and um, they uh, came up on the 24th of October and uh, we were in a position of... Uh, uh, Admiral Oldendorf, the uh, Oldendorf, the American uh, bloke um, in charge, uh, was crossing the T. You see, the, uh, we were strung out across the top of the uh, the bay, uh, so that anything would have to get past us to get at the the prize, the uh, the, the landing force in in the Gulf, if you can picture it. And, and these blighters were coming up from um, uh, San Bernardo Strait and uh, from Suragaya Strait. Behind the PT patrol is the destroyer picket line. Behind the destroyers are the cruisers. And behind the cruisers, the battleships. All hands are quiet. Tense, waiting. Midnight, October 24th. Inside the Japanese force, detection gear picks up their enemy. Suddenly, brilliant, searchlights dispel the night. The Battle of Surigao Strait is on. The uh, balloon went up around about uh, uh, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, he had uh, 30 PT boats, uh, motor torpedo boats, uh, guarding the uh, Surigao Strait uh, entrance to uh, greet the uh, Jap uh, ships as they came in, which they did. We could see all the flashes and that. But they, um, uh, they they were not terribly successful. They l lost one uh, MTB. Um, it was seriously damaged. I can't remember whether it was sunk or not. But um, the um, they certainly harassed the uh, oncoming ships because we could see the uh, uh, the flashes and uh, the noise and what have you uh, as they were coming into the. Uh, golf proper. Now destroyers, cruisers, battleships, all in position, all in battle stations, take up the fight. The Japanese are in the trap, and the jaws close. They were coming up in line ahead and um, the um, our destroyers got um, busy and uh, put a few uh, torpedoes into them. They hit the fuso, uh, which was a, a, 
one of the battleships and um, slowed her down and uh, put a few more fish in and eventually broke her back. And as we uh, saw her uh, sinking, she was just burning from, uh, uh, from one end to the other. But the um, Yamashira kept on coming with uh, uh, the other Jap cruiser, heavy cruisers, was a Mongami. And um, we uh, opened up at, uh, oh, I think it was uh, shortly after three o'clock. And the only light that you got was from the explosion of the shells and the uh, star shells and that sort of stuff. And the Yamashira mistook us, we think, for a battleship because of all the, the smoke and flame that our guns uh, uh, emitted when we fired them. Um, the Americans used a different type of ammunition, which was uh, not as noticeable. The Aranta, the Australian destroyer, he was in charge of one lot of boats going in, and in the end, he was told to get out. He fired his torpedoes more or less at um, 2,000 yards. And the, and the American ones, they fired their torpedoes and shot through, and he was left on his own going in against the Japanese uh, ships. He fired all his torpedoes and he scored hits because the, the others were that far away. They it was more or less hit or miss with, with them. battleships that arose from the muck and humiliation of Pearl Harbor. California, West Virginia, Tennessee, Maryland. Deliver salvo after salvo. With the Japanese under their guns, the old battleships take their vengeance at Surigao Strait. At three o'clock in the morning, the, the, the uh, guns opened fired. And uh, the Shropshire was firing at the um, Yamashiro, which was a Japanese ba uh, battleship. And uh, we've seen the tr green traces they, they fired. And never forget, uh, that was one of the exciting times we had, seeing these traces coming and the ex shells exploding just short of us. Then the next, next lot went whistling over the top. And then as the third lot started coming, uh, there was about four or five of us there watching it. We made a, a dive for cover and landed belly first uh, behind a metal protection. <laughs> but the uh, ship had already changed uh, course anyway and uh, the shelts landed harmlessly. <laughs> but it, um, see, all our guns was radar controlled. And uh, what's the name? At one stage I was on the, the 285 which uh, showed how the shells went. You could see the shells going over and you could see them landing short of the target or over the target. And the radar operator's job was to say it was 50, 50 yards short or 50 yards over or they were on target. And uh, then the gunnery officer would, once they, they got the proper range, uh, then the fire, usually they, they only fired a couple of shells at a time. Then before full broadsides, uh, they'd, they'd fire the big 8 inch guns that the shops you had. And it was really uh, a most incredible sight <clears throat> because you had this line of ships um, all shooting in the one direction very to a focal point and they were firing tracer ammunition <clears throat> and so you could see all this stuff hose piping towards the lead ship, the Japanese force. Well, we opened fire just a little later when it came within our range, our radar range and we fired full flash cordite. The other thing was that all the American ships fired what we call flashless cordite. There was no great sheet of flame out of the muzzles of the gun. When we fired, um, we were firing full flash cordite because we didn't have the flashless. So needless to say, if you weren't... When, when um, you were the, the firing gong went ting, ting, and you'd close your eyes automatically and they'd go bang and then you'd open them. Because if you had your eyes open during that broadside, you were blinded, you couldn't see anything. 
So that was one thing you had to do, and I was up in the uh, in the control position. <clears throat> um, so we fired, and uh, because we had full flash cordite, which was one target that the Japanese reckon they could see. So we did get some shells over the top of us, uh, but it didn't last very long because the weight of fire from all ships concentrating was just too much, and the, the battleship was finally pounded into uh, submission. We opened up on the Yamashira uh, at a range of uh, seven miles and uh, firing by radar and she fired at us and it looked like the rear lights of a, a, a car coming towards us. Uh, it was an amazing thing to, to realise that this high explosive shell would get red hot with the uh, friction of the air and glow like a blessed uh, red light. But um, four went over the top of us and they must have been pretty low, uh, plonked in the water and two in front of us. That's, that's what they call a straddle. So the next uh, round uh, theoretically should have been a uh, hit. But we and the other battleships behind us were pouring so much um, stuff into her uh, that she didn't have a chance of uh, getting away another shot. We, we, we fired over 300 shells at the um, Yamashiro and, and uh, other ships. Um, what's the name? The, in fact, the, uh, once again, our gunnery officer didn't open fire for about four minutes after the uh, word open fire was given. The, the Yanks wanted to know was something wrong with their guns. Once again, the, the first shell hit the, hit, hit the Japanese ship and, and put it on fire. See, so he was th that way. They just opened fire and willy-nilly sort of thing and hoped they hit the target. But with the, with the radar, he uh, got the actual range, the directions, what directions we were going. and It's very complicated. To, if two ships are moving in different directions, and you've got to fire and hit the other ship and... There's a lot of, a lot of complex, uh, complex uh, figuring out there. Oh, they roar across the top. You can hear them. Uh, as long as you can hear them, they're not going to hit you. Uh, but, of course, the sound from that... I was actually inside uh, a control position, and so you could really hear the thump, thump, thump of the guns along, along, along the line of ships, so to speak, and our own broadsides going off. But uh, the, the, your shell, you don't hear your shell going away. We fired for about, um, what, about nine, to 12 minutes, I think it was, and got away 32 broadsides. And that was quite good going at that time. I think, uh, it, of course, the sight of tracer ammunition uh, going anywhere, whether it's from a machine gun or uh, whatever gun it's fired from, is somehow uh, uh, requires, draws your attention, you know. Uh, when in Surigao Strait, as I explained, we had these cruisers and battleships and destroyers uh, across the T. And you had all these ships open fire at the same time. And you had all this stuff hose piping in to this concentration, the leading. It was really, truly fascinating sight. I, you know, I doubt very much if many people have seen a sight like that as we did. Um, and of course, all the other ships were seeing, seeing exactly the same thing. And it went on for several hours, but our actual firing, I think, only went on for something like uh, 20 or 25 minutes, in which case we fired like, 32 broadsides at, at the Japanese battleship, the, the Yamashiro, which had 14 inch guns and we had 18 inch guns, but fortunately they didn't get our range and they, their uh, projectile were whistling overhead. <laughs> and uh, we were accredited with with um, hitting them with 16 of our 32 broadsides, but 
Uh, we had two American cruisers firing at them at the same time and later on some battleship, but the battleship didn't fire very many shells. And one battleship told us our captain only fired six shells, you know, where we fired 32 broadsides of anything up to eight, eight inch shells, whatever was ready at the time, you know, when they sometimes they'd say fire and some of the other guns weren't ready, so they'd fire anything they could with anything from five guns to eight guns they fired in 32 broadsides. Uh, in fact, I think it lasted even less than 15 minutes, the actual firing. You know. But anyway, we uh, ended up taking part, or you can, you know, you can't say we sunk the, the Yamashiro because you don't know really. I mean, we took part, we, we assisted in the sinking of that one. I didn't personally see her sink because I think she she sank in the dark, you know, still darkness when she sank. But I certainly saw, because I had binoculars, certainly saw the, um, the shells falling, explosions around the ship and so on, and other ships down there, which were engaged by destroyers and cruisers either side and the old battleships, American battleships were there as well. But then, then we had to chase the others. The, uh, two of the Jap cruisers um, collided when, you see, they had to swing around uh, to bring their guns to bear. As they were coming straight ahead, they could only fire their, uh, their, their forward guns. And, and when they swung around, uh, they <laughs> collided and did the job for us. Um, anyway, we we uh, had a very successful um, turkey shoot, as you could say. That In the Battle of Surigao Strait, the enemy's naval force was overwhelmingly defeated. But the Japanese central force knifed down from San Bernardino Strait and attacked U.S. escort carriers and destroyers sinking four ships. At 10 that morning, Halsey's plane spotted the enemy, and within 10 hours, his task force sank four Japanese carriers. The remnants of the decoy force turned and fled. Halsey sped south, but too late. The Japanese central force unaccountably left the area. And so, um welded the ship together. Why? Because of the only Australian cruiser. Quitted ourselves, it was fine. You see, it's, it's a good feeling. Uh, we didn't feel so good later that morning when we withdrew from, uh, because the Japanese had another huge force east of Leyte Gulf, just outside the Gulf, which is what was called the Battle of Samar, and they had their two huge battleships out there. We didn't know it at the time. The Masashi and the uh, Yamato, and um, they were discouraged from coming into Lady Gulf by a small force of uh, baby carriers outside, uh, attacking them with fire with aircraft, and absolutely heroic actions by uh, American destroyers. And eventually, um, the Kurita, the Admiral, turned his ship north and went back north to San Bernardino. But we were a bit worried because we were very low on ammunition, having been uh, bombarding for the 20th, one, two, three, about three or four days, and um, not much left to uh, shoot at this force outside. So we fortunately didn't have to. But it would have been a very, very unhappy, very tricky time. But that was the value of air power some of the baby carriers, of course, suffered damage, but they were tremendous in fighting off this Japanese force. But I believe we were very, very fortunate to come out of it so well in the Surigao Strait because a huge Japanese force of ships came down uh, towards the, uh, the Leyte Gulf and they split for some reason or another. If they had have remained together, it, there's every likelihood that 
they would have sunk quite a number of our ships because they had a huge force there and uh, they split and we uh, we fought sort of half this particular uh, group that there was. We outnumbered the uh, Japanese in the uh, in the Surigao Strait. We had, we had something like six battleships, eight cruisers, a couple of dozen destroyers, and uh, about 30 or 40 patrol torpedo boats, which were fast, very small craft, which sped in with a couple of torpedoes and let them go and then got, got out very quickly. Uh, but the Japanese were able to sink a number of those in the Surigao Strait. But they, uh, apart from uh, getting a few hits on, uh, on a couple of our ships, they, uh, they didn't sink any of our main ships. But uh, we managed to, uh, I say we, that's the, the Americans plus two Australian ships, sunk... Uh, two battleships, two Japanese battleships, 33,000 tonne battleships, uh, I think perhaps a couple of destroyers and a cruiser, just from memory I think it was something like that, but uh, we were able to, uh, you know, drive them off, they, they just went their way and, and got out of it as quickly as possible, where they went to I'm not too sure. But some of them were left uh, burning, some had been sunk, some s sank later and uh, and we uh, retired back uh, around the Lady Gulf area to patrol that area and, and support the uh, ground forces. <laughs> The debris of Japanese disaster litters mile after mile of Surigao Strait. More than 5,000 Japanese sailors are wounded, missing, dead. The survivors, fanatical to the last, refuse to be rescued. The Japanese southern force is destroyed. This epic naval battle marked the end of the Japanese fleet as an active surface force. In spite of faulty coordination between top U.S. commanders, the battle for Leyte Gulf was a resounding U.S. victory. A victory which ensured the success of the Philippine campaign, since no further large-scale naval attacks could be made by the enemy on the Philippine beachheads. The battle for Leyte Gulf was a notable milestone on the road to the final defeat of Japan. Do you see, we came away from Surigao Strait that the Japanese, uh, one or two ships only retired, the rest were sunk. That was a victory. It was the last great service battle, surface battle of World War II. In fact, probably it would be the last big surface battle of all time because modern weapons change all that now. Oh, the, the, the uh, Yangshu, wherever they went, they made a show, real sh showmanship. But uh, I, got, I got on right with them as far as personal concern, but, uh, but they were always better than anyone else. <laughs> so they reckon. <laughs> oh, we got on all right together, and because um, I, I know. Um, the, the Shropshire at one stage, when we was up at Manus, um, for a case of whiskey, um, we bought a jeep off the Yanks. What's the name? We brought it back on, onto the ship, loaded it on the ship and painted blue and put, uh, our number was C-34, they put, painted C-34 on the, on the jeep. And when they came back to Sydney, they was driving around the streets in Sydney. <laughs> for about the, this jeep for a bottle of uh, a, a, a case of whiskey. That was that was a good joke. That one was. Mind you, we were on a very lucky ship, and we uh, hardly got hit by enemy uh, fire at all. I mean, we got hit 
hit by pieces of suicide planes or uh, that broke up just before they uh, hit our ship or broke up and parts fell on our deck or their bombs exploded just close beside the ship but never actually, no bomb ever hit our ship. So they were very, very fortunate. While there were many other ships around us being hit by them. Shropshire was never hit all the time. I, I can say this, I was one of the lucky ones. All the time through it, the, all the ships I was on, uh, we only ever had one casualty. And that casualty was an electrician who got electrocuted when I was on the Australia. And that was the uh, one occasion, only one occasion was ever, ever got shelled. Um, while I was in the game, a shore battery opened up on us and uh, once again shortened over and we changed course and then they just full bomb uh, broadsides uh, on the target. We silenced him. It was, a, it was a railway line. It was a. We think it was a uh, a gun on, on on rails on the railway line that was firing at us, but we um, we silenced it anyway. That was the only time we ever got uh, shelled.